the splendor of the king, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice, he wraps himself in life, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, tremble at his voice, how great is our God, sing with me, how great is our
Doesn't matter what you're going to, doesn't what the enemy wants to tell you, God is on your side. Amen. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. And don't you be afraid. Joy comes in the morning. Troubles they don't last always. For there's a friend in Jesus who will wipe your tears away. And if your heart is broken, just lift your hands and say, You don't have to worry. You don't have to worry. And don't you be afraid. Joy comes in the morning. Troubles, they don't last always. For there's a friend in Jesus who will wipe your tears away. And if your heart is broken, just lift your hands and say, I know that I can make it. I know that I can stand. No matter what may come my way, my life is in your hand. With Jesus, with Jesus I can take it. With Him I know I can stand. No matter what may come my way. comes in the morning, troubles they don't last always, for there's a friend in Jesus who will wipe your tears away, and if your heart is broken, just lift your hands and say, I know that I Jesus, I can take it. With him, I know I can stand. No matter what may come my way, my life is in your hands. So when your tests and trials, so when your tests and trials, they seem to get you down, and all your friends and loved ones. Just lift your hands and say, I know that I can make it. I know that I can stand. No matter what may come my way, my life is in your hands. With Jesus, I can take it. With him. I know that I can 
Praise Amen. Thank you, Lord. A thousand generations. Thank you, God. Thank you, generations. Falling down in the worship. To sing the song of ages to the land of us. And all who's come before us.
Yes, truly is. The word. You are holy. Hallelujah. And therefore, Father, we thank you. Yes, we thank you, O oh God, because we know we serve a holy God that doesn't require us to do anything to be saved. For the very faith that we use, we practice to believe comes from you. And you are the one that's encouraging us from inside of us to believe, Hallelujah. to trust in you. Therefore, Father, we ask you to continue having your way, that you may continue to raise us up, O oh Father, Hallelujah. to be glorified with you. And therefore, Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Let us all say Hallelujah. amen. Amen. Good morning, church. If you're in need of an envelope, please raise your hand so the ushers can see you and provide you with one. If you're here for the first time or have been attending for a while, we're, we are so delighted that you're here. We want to welcome you, and it's our hope that you'll both enjoy and be blessed by service today. The announcements are as follows. On Wednesday nights, we have Bible study at 6 p.m., followed by intercessory worship and that's at 7 p.m. On Fridays we have tearing one hour at the mercy seat. Um, we just began the month of November and this is the second Sunday in November we usually collect for Brothers Keepers so please make a notation that next week we will be collecting for Brothers Keepers. The Christmas Fellowship remember make a notation in your calendar is December 18th for those of you that are unaware, Pastor John is going to be away in the mission field for Thanksgiving. So he's leaving November 22nd, so he'll be unable to partake of a Thanksgiving with his family and his wife. So what we would propose to do is bless him by having a Thanksgiving fellowship for him on the Sunday before Thanksgiving, which is November 20th. Okay? This, the menu has already been set, so just check with Miss Debbie to see what's needed. Again, the menu's set, so you need to check with Miss Debbie so we're not duplicating anything. Okay, um, also the ushers will be passing out a questionnaire. They've probably beat me to the punch already. Um, and it's, we would like to start the fellowship again. Um, so just take a moment to fill out the questionnaire so we can see 
how we're going to present it moving forward and how you can contribute because everyone we participate in the fellowship and it should be everyone participating um, so please don't leave until you filled out at least one please um, attention men mark your calendars for December 9th for men's camping at Camp Whiteman for more information will be forthcoming um, as the contract is finalized and last, if you notice, those leaves, the never-ending leaf issue. Um, so there's three piles, you notice, in the driveway and tarps. So there's rakes, there's tarps. They're located outside the fellowship entrance in the box. They'll be there 24-7. So, you know, we know that some of you can't make the weekend. So when you can make it, even if it's an hour, an hour helps. Those of you got houses and property, someone coming over to help really is, is helpful so um, if you have any questions about any of that you can see Billy or call Billy um, again um, come whenever you can again if it's just an hour we'll appreciate it we, we thank you the uh, title scripture is found in Matthew 6 25 through 31 therefore I say to you do not worry about your life what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon, in all his glory, was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? The Lord does not want us to be anxious about anything. He does not want us to lose sleep, staying up late at night and waking early with little rest, overly concerned about making ends meet, fearing we may have to do without. He asks... Can all our wearing add something as easy as 18 inches to our height? Why then do we worry about life's necessities? The Lord asks us to carefully observe the lilies of the field. If he would so splendidly clothe the grass with flowers, would he not, with even more care, provide us with all of our needs? So let's lift up our tithes and offerings before the Lord. We thank you, Father God, that you are our provider. There is none save you, Father God. And so we commit these tithes and offerings into your hand, Father God. Use it to further your kingdom. We thank you for giving us the means to give, Father God. Help us to have a heart to give freely, Father God. Prepare us, Father God. Help us not to be found wanting when you come, Father God. Help us to not be those newborn babies, Father God, but to listen and obey. In Jesus' name, amen.
is the Lord. We are of more value than any sparrow. You know, growing up, and the same with, if not most of us, if not all of us, we never learn about our blessings or the call on our lives, how we should work. We were never taught how to take hold of these things. We grew up with all type of, you know, the church wasn't a place where we can go and learn. It's a place where everything was set and we knew exactly what we were going to do and how long we were going to spend in there and then leave. Because it takes time to learn. We never did. We grew up, we didn't hear about that. We so many excuses. Then after, even when we came into the newer system, you hear miracles were, you know, not happening like they happened then. And when, and what's the difference? Did our God change? It seemed like that because and we were never taught to take hold of the call on our lives because it wasn't taught that the call on our lives is not a particular, like going on a mission field or so. The call on our lives is that we grow up to be children of God. We were being taught to be children of God. That's what the word of, that's why we come to church. That we learn to conduct ourselves in a way that's pleasing to our Father. We are called to be Christians. In other words, that's why sometimes when certain things change, even saying Christian and Christianity, it makes it look like, sound like we are Christians. I'm a believer. I'm a believer. The church was actually called the way. And later on, because of the insults that Paul was going through in the Asian countries, they were being insulted that they were, they were nicknamed Christian because there was, was an insult because uh, they were saying we, fo we were following a dead man. Because we believe he was raised from the dead and the world knew that he was crucified. But we believe he was raised. So it was an insult and they took the name and it became popular and to this day they're still using it. We are believers, we believe. We believe, and because we believe, the Holy Spirit is able to work with us, to fashion us and shape us, that we can become, what? Children of God. That's what God wants. Who, who which parent want their children grow up in the home to go out and become gangsters, murderers, thieves, Doing things that, you know, that wouldn't bring what? Shame. Every parent wants their children to be even more successful than they are. There's no difference with our father. When he was leaving, he says, greater things than I have done shall you do. Not because we're going to do it on our own. He is the one going to help us. He is the one helping us to do those things. So he want us to do even be better than he was. That is what we have to be taught. We're supposed to learn those things because we are important. Bible says even the hairs, our heads are continually being, the numbers are continually changing. So we never learn how to live the way 
that God wants us to live. And you hear the things that goes on with people in the church, the excommunication, the mafia, the sitting in church dedicating a baby while the murdering, having murders going on outside at the same time, the church taking money from, from these unlawful organizations, when all that in the Bible says, do not do that. Well, slowly what happened? The power waned. People were fighting to become of position. People were fighting. Those with more money and more political power were fighting to be head of, they were fight. listen, the struggle it is to put a pope, which is supposed to be the man, that's over the administration of the churches in place. We're supposed to be called and nominated by the leaders of the church. They're not. It's political. The bunch of things that go on. So you see again, where they led armies into war, and God said, let them try to live in peace with your neighbors. And they didn't go to war because for a special reason to protect. They went to war because people just didn't want to have nothing to do with them, with their political agenda in the church. So, what's, so what went on for centuries? And that's why we call it, you know, that time was called actually the Dark Ages. When the church loses the light, or well, we're supposed to be the light. When we stop being a light, the world will go right back into darkness. Because the world was in darkness when he came. The Bible says, when he came, he walked where those who sat in darkness. The world sat in darkness, and he came. And he's asked us to be the light, to represent him, because he is the light. And he asks us to represent him and to be a light in the world. So we have to learn, what, do we, what are we as this light? So we had to be taught, because we were not taught. These are the, this is the call in our lives. It isn't the striving to attain certain positions in church, church is simplest, si simple, one reason. We even heard last week, the reason, the res I have a responsibility to teach, is it not true? Four reasons. Do you know also that I'm warned? All of us, everybody who wants to assume the position to preach the gospel, is warned. They are warned that if they don't preach the gospel and somebody do something that's wrong, is doing wrong, and you don't preach the gospel, let them know it was wrong, something to stop doing, right? And they do the wrong, it will be required from the preacher. But he did not teach it. But you see, if he teach it and he could do the wrong, then we required from them. So you see, there's a warning. But it's not only to stop doing something. What about your blessings? To preach, to know that we have to learn how to take hold of our blessing. It doesn't just go one, two, three. It goes, it is do good and have faith in God. It's two things. We gotta teach the boat to let people know this is how we will take hold of our blessings. Because the prophets back in Israel, all this they preached was good news, you know. They would tell no troubles are going to come. They were doing what it was supposed, no troubles are going to come. No troubles. All those, all those prophets, look how many are preaching that we're going to get trouble, and how many of them have died and we haven't seen any trouble. Well, 400 years, and there was Babylon. 
And they didn't learn and kept returning until they almost extinguished Israel from the face of the earth. So God is saying, everything has to be taught. And so again, your blessings and all start to know. Now, listen, and as the wisdom increases, you start finding out that, wait a minute, the life that we call to live is not only for this earth, not only for this time. Because we, we continue, we live in eternal. It will continue. It will continue. So many people want to hear certain things, but we are not hearing it. Then come a time where we want to hear only the good side. But we heard of four reasons why, why the gospel is preached or taught. We know there's also God is encouraging the church. There's ways that God is encouraging the church not to allow, not to come and just casually hear the gospel. Who wants to see it? This is the reason now why the church has to be careful what they hear and what they are hearing. If we turn our Bibles to the book of Hebrews, we're going to look there at chapter 2. We're going to read here from verse 1 to 3. It says, therefore, it was a collective saying of then before, and it was a those saying, therefore, we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard. He didn't just say, give heed, or he said, earnest heed. So it's like saying, it's not new, but God put an emphasis, a more earnest, more sincere, careful attention to what we are hearing. And it went on, said, lest we drift away. In other words, we allow those things that we hear to pass us by. To not to allow what we hear to pass us by. Hold on. To what? He said, lest we drift away. You will drift away if you don't hear what you're supposed to hear. For if the word spoken through angels proves steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? So God is saying, nothing is going to pass by. So take heed carefully what you're hearing. And then he gave us an example that how, what Israel did. Israel did exactly that. I want to show you something. If we go to chapter 3, to verse 7, we jump forward a bit. Because he was talking about hearing. He said, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, today, if you will hear, you see, remember he said, take heed to the earnest heed the things that we what? Hear. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. How can you harden your heart? When you hear something that you don't really want to do or believe or whatever, you have a reason or an explanation to brush it off. Whatever the reason, we're preparing ourselves for difficulties. Listen what he goes on to say. If, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in a rebellion in the day of trial in the wilderness where your fathers tested me and tried me and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was angry at that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart and have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. See, they have not known my ways. 
How do we get to know his way? By knowing the word and living by the word of God. He says, beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. An evil heart of unbelief says, you either believe what you're hearing, if you reject it, it's because you don't believe. Isn't that true? And when you reject God's word, the Bible says, let there, it, it's referred to in the Bible as a, an evil heart. But exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For if we have become partakers of Christ, for we have become part of, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. As a, that's the second time he's re repeating something in a few verses. He's not going to stop. For who having heard rebelled? Indeed, was it not all who came out of Egypt led by Moses? Now with whom was he angry 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose corpses fell in the wilderness? And whom did he swear that it would not enter his rest? But to those who did not obey. So we see that they could not enter in because of what? Of unbelief. Now this entering in is very special, you know. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. They did not what? Believe. Because if you believe, you will do it. Because faith is evident by works. Faith is proven by what you do. Believing, if you believe, you will be doing it. For we, have, for we who have believed do enter that rest. Now I want to ask you. We see, then God is saying that people allow the word to pa pass by for whatever the reason, because sometimes we want to practice the way we live, contrary to what the Word of God says. That's why I say people should take counsel when a decision is being made, when it has something to do, part of your faith. If anything you're going to make a decision is going to affect the life you live for God, take heed, take counsel. God will direct your footsteps. He will protect us. He will. He said, why? Why? What did they say? They heard it, but what they didn't do, they didn't mix what they heard with faith. We say, in other words, they did not believe what they really heard, but continued to live the life that they pleased. Now he says, but those who believe shall enter their rest. But what it is? It's a work, right? He said, if you read it, it's a work. What is our work? Yeah. What is our work? You know, you know the Israelites, when Jesus Christ explained some of these things to them, they came to him and says, what is that, the work that you said that, that we should do that we can be saved? Simply, the other one question. What can we do, what works can we do that we can be saved? What is our work? We turn our Bibles to the book of John. Book of John, John chapter 6. They were there asking him, questioning him. But I'll give you the answer he gave them. In John chapter 6, verse 28. And that same chapter, he gave them the biggest revelation that my body is bread indeed and my blood. But in earlier, we got it still all through the chapter, they was asking them certain questions. Then he said these words to them, 
Then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him whom he said. That we believe. That's our, our work. We have to believe. Believing is not just because you quietly hear it. I come as I want to hear. You remember, the banners are witnessed all of us always. I lived, when I came to the Lord, I came to the Lord twice. The first time I came, I didn't know, I didn't come to the Lord to look at what others are doing. You come to the Lord to in this talk, it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship. You come to church, not to hear what somebody else has to learn. You don't come to church what your husband has to learn, what your wife has to learn. You don't come to church what your, what your children has to learn. You come to church for you to learn. The one and one. And I went to church, but I became judgmental because I was looking upon my siblings and I continue seeing that though we are born again, they almost live their life like they were not born again. And because, and I became judgmental and not realizing I was doing the very same. See why a young person in Christ cannot be a preacher? You know why? You can tell people what to do, things that they're not doing. What did I want them to do? I wanted them to stop doing the wrong I saw them doing during the week, right? Did I stop mine? No. Because I became what? Self-righteous. Though it was, happened to be with the born again, see why the word of God was given to us to judge ourselves, not to judge another. And the moment you learn the Bible or application, you will apply it, but you're going to lose it to judge people to condemn people. When you use it to watch your own actions, your own lifestyle, and not make demands on someone else by the word of God, you do not use the word of God to demand nothing from nobody. The demand is personal, one-on-one. -on -one. And so I did. I end up losing my way and thank God for grace and mercy that after 13 years I found he came and looked for me and I didn't make, I decided that day I'm selling out every day. I don't care what I have, I'm giving away. I, I want to change. I don't want to be the same person no more. And I struggled. Now look at this. The first time I wasn't seeing I was making mistakes. When I came back the second time, I saw I was making mistakes and I struggled to want to change. And I struggled with my weakness. I struggled with my flesh. And I, and I saw how difficult it was to change. Then I found that, reading the Bible and hearing the Bible, I found that scripture. How can I? How can a young man cleanse his way? I wanted to stop what I was doing. I wanted to change my life. And I found the struggle. Then I found that scripture. Father, teach me thy way. Teach me your word. That I may hide your word in my heart. Not in my mind. I don't want to know it by study. I want to know it by believing. That's what you're asking of me. I want to do that. You can't do it in your own strength. That I may hide it within my heart. That I may sin against thee no more. That's why we learn the Bible. Because I'm telling you this. Life looks boring sometimes, looks long when we go through difficulties. 
It goes by faster than we think. We all one day are going to stand. I don't want to stand for things that could have changed. And definitely, I will not hold back the gospel from you. Because if you make mistakes and I don't tell you the truth, I don't want to stand because I didn't tell you the truth. I have to pay for your mistakes also. And I study diligently because I don't want to teach error. There's another way to. I can hold back the truth, but I can also teach error because I haven't been properly taught. Because to be properly taught is not learning. Properly taught is hearing and receiving the gospel and living by it. That's when the understanding comes. That then properly teach you how to walk and you make mistakes. Because the mistakes you make because I teach you error, I'm going to pay for that too. Because he warned us. Try not to give instructions in the gospel. Try not. Who want to see that? It takes so this is what take will take away if the church will hear these scriptures over will stop people from striving. But the church taught the people to strive. First Timothy. I'm going to show you something. Timothy was a young pastor, and he wasn't sure of what he was doing. He was very timid. You're going to come to see. You're going to see how much we have to change before God will allow us sometimes to give instruction to someone else. When parents give instructions to children, does the children ex expect to turn and see the parents do the same thing they tell them not to do? That's why you hear some parents say, oh, I'm adult, I can do this, but a child can't. We've got to be careful using words like that. Or we get a situation like that guy from home alone. This is what it says. I'm in the wrong book. There you go. You know, the Holy Spirit just told me I'm in the wrong book. Let me go to the right. Okay. It's James. My brethren, let many of you become teachers. Let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we will receive a stricter judgment. Try not to be teachers knowing that you who teach will receive a stricter judgment than those that hear you. Because if your teachings are not good, you're going to carry both their sins and your own sins. That's what I said. If I don't teach the truth, to help you, to guide you, and you make mistakes, I'll be responsible. Go and read the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel was, that's what Ezekiel was said. God told Ezekiel this. If I give you a word, and through fear you don't want to give it, and a lot of, a lot of us sometimes, we are intimidated by the church. You can't, you can't take it. You do what you know you have to do. You shake up your shoulder, and let the Holy Ghost make you brave. He delivered the word that God gave you. He said this. He said, if I put a word in you and you don't pass it on and the people do wrong, their sins are going to require it from you. But if you teach what I tell you and they don't do it, then it will, their sins will be required by them because I sent and told them the truth. And that's the teaching of a pastor. Now he's saying, though, but be careful. Don't become teachers. Don't go telling people to do things if you are not living the same way. Okay, one, you'll never teach the truth. You cannot do wrong and teach right. Because if I'm doing wrong and I teach pure the right, won't I be judging myself? 
So then I have to twist the word I teach. That it doesn't sound acceptable. There's a reason. There's a reason why I'm allowed to do this. You know, you know how people twist the word to say they have a reason that allows them to do certain things? I don't, there's no reason. In the Bible, you'll never find a reason to do something that's wrong. Never. If you do, show me it. Then I can quit. <laughs> then I always can find a reason to quit. <coughs> there is no reason. God doesn't give us no reason at all. No justified reason not to do, and I didn't say do wrong, not to do right. There's not. So he warns us, this is what we have to do. So he told them, don't allow what you hear to slip you by. You came to hear a gospel, a word, that you can take that word and hide it in your heart. That it can, when the time comes, that word can come back to you and stop you from doing something that is wrong. Or guide you to do what is required by God. A righteous life. You know how many people talk against these things as if these things are not written. So our work is to believe what we hear, to mix what we hear with faith. We didn't. We came to church to learn those things, to hear what I have to stop and start doing what I'm supposed to do. We are not. We don't own our own lives and. We don't make decisions. Why did God say he bought us and our lives belong to him? Because so that we can understand, stop making decisions for yourself without consulting me. Not, not because he wants to dominate, because he wants to save us. He wants to protect us from our own selves. He wants to protect us from our own selves. Don't you feel sometimes you need to be protected from your own self? What should you get angry and notice, man, would somebody just deliver me for myself? I know I have to do this, but I don't want to do it. I want to do that. I want to go here. I want to do this. I want to make my own decisions. So you see, God said, no, we, we're not. That's what we said. Oh, let's go one right. Oh, let's go here and there and let's start a business. We make money. And who say you're going to make money? Did you commit it to the Lord? Did you commit it to the Lord? Is it followed God's counsel? So you see again, there's always a plan that seems right to us, but it leads to destruction. The Bible says, but if you commit your plans to me, one, God will straighten out the plan a little bit. God will help you to straighten out the plan. Then he'll help you to be successful in the plan you're going to do. And the plan you're going to have to straighten out to do is going to look more risky than the one you even had. But he's behind it. And he is going to give it success. You know that? The one you have that looks successful is going to lead you to trouble. The one that God tells you to do looks risky. But it's faith. God asks me to do it. I'm going to do it. It looks risky. I'm going to take a chance. I'm not having nothing. Do you want to take a chance to take your whole family to a nation where you don't have nothing to get from it and watch your money finishing? And no, I could pack up. I could pack up and go on back home. Then he wouldn't tell me a word. You know, I could have, I could have gone back and he wouldn't tell me nothing. I won't be standing doing this. I might have been... Well, I might not have been a wealthy businessman as I thought either. You see, God has a plan, and he's going to help you to be successful in it. It sometimes looks shaky. It will, no, it will always look shaky because the enemy is going to come after you to make you look like that plan will never work. What God is telling you will never work. But that's what you got to jump up and do because that's the one that God is putting in your heart to do. That's why, when, listen, that's why he said, when we say we want to get only blessings, 
Sometimes you say, but I prayed. I prayed. Sometimes just prayer alone doesn't, doesn't work. If you're out of line, who wants to see that just prayer doesn't always work? It doesn't always work by itself. I want to read Psalm 37 to you. I read the whole psalm because the whole psalm. Con- There's some people used to come at me, and, but we prayed. I said, but you're still doing wrong things. How can you do wrong things? Continue living the life you're living. No, I'm not saying people who just born again, all of us still doing wrong. But he's talking the wrong that we don't know we're doing is not holding us accountable for. But the wrong you know you're doing, that is holding us accountable for. If you cannot do wrong that you know you're doing, you should stop and want to pray. Because the wrong we're doing is the one that's going to rob us from the answer to our prayer. It's going to take us out of the path. Listen, people always think, oh, I can, we can pray. Listen, you can pray for the worst sinner and you can be the worst sinner and watch God do something for you. Because what he's doing, he's drawing you by his blessings to take a chance to walk on that straight and narrow path. But once you know you should walk on this path, you decide you're going to step off the path. You purposely made a decision. When you make a decision not to do what is required of you, you actually are looking for trouble. You're doing something because it raises, the, it raises also the requirements against you. But I want to read it for the psalm. So do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. What is he saying? When you go into church, you see no people who are doing wrong. It look like it seems like they're prospering. Because these psalms are written in the nation of Israel, the whole church. When you know millions. And people going, he said that when David wrote Psalm, when he said, My enemies, people who wanted to fight against him, he called the people who didn't want to obey God's word his enemy. If you read the Psalms carefully, you see, he spoke many a times about people going to church but they don't have the same faith. Listen, do not fret, nor be enemies of workers. For they shall soon be cut down like grass. And with as green herb. Listen to what it is. This is the word here. Verse 3. Trust in the Lord. That's have faith, right? Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. You don't have to go out and do something wrong to get something. God said, if you trust me, you walk, I make sure you're going to receive it. I will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light. You see, what you do right, it's not going to stay in the dark. You're going to bring it out. And your justice as the noonday. Rest on the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. Because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. For evil doers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees his days coming. Listen, it can be somebody sitting next to you. So people, people, all kind of people, I'm not talking about this church. I'm talking, I went to churches where people sat down and almost hated one another. They plotted against one another. I saw it. I saw it. 
And now you want to tell me if you keep yourself right and trust in the Lord and doing what is right. And I'm talking, those people doing the wrong, do good to them. That's where your faith goes. Do good to them. But people go and sit in church and plot your destruction. I saw it. It's happened here too. But they will never, they will never succeed. Because when you put your trust in the Lord and do good, he will give you the desires of your heart. He's going to watch over you and protect you, and keep you safe. Nothing will come near you. You will see a thousand fall on your left and ten on your right. But not that none of those evil things that they plot shall come near you. He will watch over you. These are the promises God made. But he didn't just say, trust in me. The trust in me and do good. Come to hear his pastor preach today. Praise the Lord. You're enjoying it too today. Amen. I like to see behave easy, you know. <laughs> Hallelujah. So you see again, this is what God wants from us. So you see, we can't just, I can go ahead and read. Maybe you should take it, read Psalm 37. Do you know Psalm 73, the flip number is almost the same, you know. I always get mixed up between the two. When I look in there, sometimes um, God say, don't look at the people who seem to be prospering in your midst if they're doing wrong. I've seen people go to the church in business, they prosper and doing wrong. So they will all come to calamity, they will all fail. If you trust me and do good, you'll delight yourself in the land and in the fullness of all it has to provide. That's what God wants us to do. Trust, believe, and if you believe, do good. Do what you believe. Simple. Believe and do it. If you believe it, if you heard it, believe and go out and do it. Live by it. Help to change. If you have a struggle, change it. Who said you don't want to have trouble? Didn't you just hear I say, I struggled. I cried out. It didn't happen in a day, a week, a month. I will cry out and watch myself stumble. That's why I have to hear the truth. That's why I have to hear somebody who went through it and said, some people just want to do as if they are good at two shoes. They hear the gospel and they live by it. And you, you can't, you mustn't tell them about your struggles. But Paul had his struggles. Jesus also had his difficulties. I'm going to show you it just now. I will stumble and I'll fall. But I will regret. I would weep and I'll cry out, Lord, help me. I would fast. I would fast. You know what it is? You want to fast 21 days on water while you're working? Huh? Come on. I was serious. I wanted to change. When I said I wanted to change, I wanted to change. And learning the Bible wasn't sufficient. I had to not just, I had to want to want to change. Because sometimes you ever want something, but you really don't want to let go. Some people say, man, I want to stop smoking. I say, you're lying. You're thinking about the cigarette you want to smoke when you go outside. So you really don't want, you want to stop, but you don't want to stop either. You have no, you, come on, come on, come on. You know what you're doing is wrong, and the beginning of it starts by saying you want to stop. But that's a good beginning. You can stop it. A week go by, two weeks go by, you find yourself stumbling and doing the same thing you wanted to stop. Because sometimes we think we want to stop. So we cry out, God, take it from me, can't take. Lord, help me. Help me. Help me to let go and trust you. He's working in us, right? You cannot trust in your own will. You can't trust in your own strength. The Bible said, put your trust in the Lord. So when you make a decision to stop, 
You'll notice you're stumbling. Then you cry out, Lord God, I need your help. Now, do you take hold of that help also? Do you take a pressing in, you know? You're going to take a pressing in. Church, it doesn't just happen. The devil will play games with you. He'll toy with you. But if you're serious, I know a man, over 26 years ago I met him. He has a talent. He has an ability to reach out to the community like an evangelist and bring in people. When I met him, I knew somebody had put him out in the field before his time. And I warned, don't be careful. But I am close to that man. I working with him all those years. And I told him recently, I said, maybe you might not work with me in this life. But keep this hope in you. Who we'll say you might not work with me in the other life? Work we going to work. Work we going to work. But you see, the hope we have isn't just for this life. Getting ready for God to use you isn't just for this life. Yes, God, you want to do something for God. But isn't it better that you change to live a, a pleasing life first? You don't think, oh, if I can get to do that for the Lord? No. Isn't it better? Listen, I mean, I, I'll tell you this again. When I had kids, and used to bring gifts for me, I, I mean, what's the greatest gift you can bring for me? If you all do the things I ask you to do. Because a gift can only be what? Kind of blinding my eyes. So what is more pleasing to the Father? You give a gift, do something great, or just simply do what he's asking of us. Simple. Be simple. Stop. Be, uh, even the people hearing me out there, they're going to, some people listen to the video. The, the, I watch the clips sometimes have a couple hundred people. So people looking. That we don't strive to accomplish, to do something for God. What God wants us to be is be his children. He wants to see us live the life that he has set before us to help us to live it. He wants us to emulate the life Jesus Christ lived. He's the first and we all following. But the church made a mistake to tell people, if you're not preaching the gospel, then you gotta consider if you're saved. Man, you gotta strive and if you get to go out. So people were now striving to do things instead of just, come. what? Striving against what? Their own flesh. But that's where the, the, that's where the problem is, you know. For you to change. And I would, I would want to change. And changes didn't happen just quick. You'll see one fall away. Then you see, like the first, first time I knew, I walked with it for 13 years, and I, you and me, I'm more than capable of doing it. So the first thing I did, I realized, I don't think I did it. Then the Lord helped me to see you and your rebellion you you capable of walking away again. I dropped to my knee, my face, and I was in my office. And I came off my desk, and I didn't want to kneel down. But I dropped to my face and said, Lord God, I'm going to commit my life into your hands that you may keep me. It was somewhere in the middle of the year. End of the year came. New Year's and New Year's was a big thing where, where we grew up. I didn't want to see fireworks. I didn't want to participate in it. Kids were small. I didn't want, the, first, the last one wasn't even born yet. I told my wife, I don't want to go greet the family tonight. Because everybody goes to 12 o'clock greeting everybody down there. Then you go home or you go somewhere else and party till sun. I said, I don't want to go nowhere. I want to go home. I want us to go home and for us to look at our lives. Now, I know she, she, I know she believed a long time that she, she married a weirdo. And it got worse when I became a Christian. Okay. So she agreed, maybe for peace's sake, right? 
And I went home and we sat down, we started looking, what did we accomplish for the Lord this year? And I remembered, I had knelt down and prayed and God brought back to my memory like a reel. And from the day I prayed, to that moment of standing there, on many occasions had shown up that I might have walked and yet protected me from myself. He protected me from myself because I asked him to protect me from myself. You see, sometimes we need protection from ourselves because we are our worst enemy ourselves. So I cried out to the Lord, protect me, keep me in the path. You see, you gotta ask. He can't force you to walk the narrow path. You have to be wanting. You've got to talk. you commit your ways. Come on, church. I did it, so you have to do it. You commit your Lord to the Lord. Help me to stay on that narrow path. Because in me, I'll find a way to come off. I'll look for a way to come off the path. Keep me. I saw, he showed me the different times from that month, now, 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 lay on my face to cry out to that, that January 1st at night. He showed me it. I said, thank you, Lord. And I knew inside of me then, that's why I found afterwards, I didn't find that yet. I found that scripture afterwards. Help me. So you, you've got to commit your ways to the Lord. You have to ask the Lord to help you to make changes, to stop certain characteristics you have in you, you have to face God and ask God to help you. Because when you know the wrong, wait a few weeks and watch, you, watch yourself bowing down back to doing it. But when you fall, you get up and you don't quit. Lord, help me. Sometimes our weakness, sometimes can be strong. Sometimes it's there because of inner pains. You're doing it. But sometimes the pains have to be healed. Sometimes before you even stop, the God got to do a work in you. We have to give God a chance. But the only way we give him a chance is by truly asking him, committing your ways to him. Ask him to help you. If you commit your way, I will prosper you. And the greatest prosperity God wants to see us is to walk that road that's pleasing to him. He will help us. He will do it. Here I stand, I'm telling you, that's how I learned, I found my way to change. God gives us dreams, visions. Let me tell you something. From the beginning, people used to come up and tell me things, and I'm like, it didn't make no sense to me. But first, I didn't even understand how the church was fit together. All I know, I come to church, sing a few songs, and I'm happy. And a man tell me the Bible, read the Bible to me. God called him, and that's it. I am a businessman. I'm willing to give how much money I need to give to prosper the church. Whatever they need, I'm ready there to do it. But I didn't know that. So he was telling me all along what he's going to do. I didn't understand. I just let go over my head. As time went by, I started seeing those things being fulfilled. Even one day, I remember somebody had given me a word and I saw it being fulfilled. This goes back about 23, 24 years ago. And I, I got happy. I said, wow, that person had given me that word. And now it's being fulfilled. And I heard a voice clear, clear say, I had spoken to you first. And it brought back to my memory that he had told me it before that person, but it was oblivious to me. So he sent somebody to give me the words I can't understand. He's the one always talks to us first. But sometimes we don't listen. We need somebody to tell us physically. And that's why I believe in all my heart, he gives us pastors. Do you know if they'll give the Lord a chance, he would love to teach us directly himself. We, we will struggle. We put it this way, 
to help us. Then he warned us, be careful what you teach. Be careful what you say in front of the people. But I didn't ask to do nothing else but to feed my children. It's like a babysitter. Somebody buy food to feed your children. You don't want to hear they're doing, feeding your children anything they want. Is it not true? Okay. So the father, serious. He's very serious. The first day he put his hand on Peter. Peter wasn't even sure what he had to do. He said, listen, Peter, let me tell you, you're running. But I'll tell you this, I want you, if, since you want to come back and want serve me, I want you to feed my sheep. That's what I want you to do. Feed. That's the call of a shepherd. Feed. Teach my sheep the word of God. And nothing else. Give them their spinach when they have to, their vitamins when they have to, their cod liver oil when you have to. Give them whatever they need. I want you and don't hold back. So listen, so we see then, we have to allow God to make the necessary changes sometimes to fulfill those visions, dreams, and so on. We have to change so that we can stand in front of people and say, you can do it too. Don't rush to take my place. Take your time. You you have to stand in my shoes. That's okay. You might do a better job even. I prefer, I like to hear you're doing a better job. But take your time to get there. Have things to change in us. Allow God's word by his spirit to change us. When a child wants to be a lawyer from small or whatever, he has, they have, that child has to learn other things to come to that place. Suppose that child didn't learn integrity and, and honesty and become a lawyer. What is he going to be as a lawyer? A crooked. So there's things that accompany all of those things that has to be taught. A shepherd has to have high respect for everybody in the church. Especially a male towards female. And fem females also for themselves. I've seen a lot of women fall, ministers, because they didn't adhere themselves to certain requirements. You think they can do what they want and get away. You can't. Nobody can do. I warn my fellow, chef, fellow colleagues, be careful. You lose your anointing, you end up talking, and you have no anointing. Your anointing can be taken from you. And my anointing, I, what? I know it's growing. This thing is easy. Do you know for weeks I'm very not concerned. I'm kind of don't know what I'm going to do when I go to Venezuela. I know I have the messages in front of me. I know that's what I have to present. But you know, I'm like, kind of like nervous or kind of like fearful. But I have a confidence because of all the other times I preach that I know you're not going to forsake me. And I know that the anointing he gave me because they're, they're increasing and they say it's going to be maybe about 2,000 now going to pastors, the wife, and one assistant. So it's not going to be the public. They say that they're reaching the whole city. This is a city of two to three million people. They want to blanket the whole city. We blanketed a big part where we had 526 pastors alone came. This time they want the pastors, the wives, and one assistant to come. And they said they're already counting 2,000 because I have to carry over 1,000 USBs. Do you know how much weight that is? So I have to carry, I can't carry books, so I can carry USBs. So we are ready. We are ready. But I have to have confidence. What's the use you go down there without anointing? How, how will those people believe what you have to say? So I have to trust that you're going to start, I start feeling the confidence coming. You know when I feel it? When I'm going to step out on that stage, the, I, I change. All fear is gone. 
I'm here. I'm a vessel. And I do not understand this too. I'm a vessel. And I'm going to tell you what the Lord has put in my heart. I don't stick to my message. I'm going to tell you what the Lord put in my heart. Because that's what I am. And when I stand up in front of them, the gospel is going to come out. I'm ready. I'm ready. Not ready like ready to preach, but the day I stand up, an anointing. You don't need the anointing until you have something to do. Samson wasn't walking around with all that power all the time. Samson was a normal man until he put his hand on the gate. And the Bible says an anointing and the Holy Ghost came upon him and he took them out of the ground. Samson was a normal man, so I am normal. That's why I have that, those human fears now. But I'm warning, click, when they say, we're going to introduce it, and they're going to say it in Spanish, for sure. They're going to introduce me, and I walk forward. I know I'm going to walk straight into the power of a living God. And when I sit on back, I know I will have accomplished what he sent me to do. Here I am, I finish. And when I finish, I say to you, you know, Lord, I'm finished. I did what you asked me to do, and thank you that you never disappointed. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. We are not here. We're not, we're not big. Look at us here. You know, most, I know a bunch of us in here who were supposed to be here this morning. Maybe they get accustomed to streaming. But we are accomplishing t things. As I always felt, I was like a David, you know. I always felt, he told me, he told me that in a walk like, uh, like Abraham, I wanted to be like David. Don't see no obstacle too big. But look what we are covering. How many thousands and thousands of people are we blanketing at the same time when we speak to the many pastors? How many thousands are we blanketing? We get in the information that God put in our heart. God gave us the books, give us this thing, and we are, hey, we are sharing it. And we prefer to do it this way because with a the USB, they can pass the books to someone else. A book, you got to borrow your book and you might then get it back. So you see, we are accomplishing and it's, 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 it's we're going three places in two weeks. So it's going to be not a little bit of work, it's going to be hard. Because I'm going to visit the second, the, the third largest city before I come. I, I, we are, we're going to be are we introducing ourselves. This, people have done the series, they're planning to cover Venezuela. When we cover these four big cities, the figure, we have covered Venezuela. I don't have to come back anymore. The first time I went, it was five years ago, and slowly the message spread until we start doing it in a blanketing fashion. We're going to go, so we're going to Valencia, but going first to, we're going first to Savannah de Mendoza, then we're going to Valencia, and then we're going to introduce myself to Barquisimeto, that's the third largest city in that country. And we're going to go there and meet with maybe 50 of the leaders in that city to introduce the message that they can take it and start inviting and planning and organizing it. So you see, we, who, whoever fathom in our heart that we'll ever do something like this? Who fathom in our hearts that we, so small, is going to be leading and guiding thousands of pastors and hundreds of thousands of people. God does things. We, all he asks us to do, commit your ways and walk. Commit your ways. Now, what we, got, we are boasting what the Lord is doing. You can't do it on your own. You, know, look at you must see you have a vision. God gave you a dream, a vision. It doesn't just happen. Kids want to be a lawyer. It doesn't just happen. You know how, what they have to go through for 20 something years before they can finally say they are? 
Let me share a, a scripture that tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5. Go there, 5, 3a. Listen to what it says here. For her dreams come true with much activity. A dream isn't just happen. God gave you a dream and a vision. It takes a lot of activity to fulfill it. A child have a dream to be a lawyer. He have a lot of activity, a lot of years before one day he step into an office and he can say, I am. Anybody, any position, anything you want in life. To be a parent. I had one of my children. You ask him when he's small, where do you want to be? A father. I watched him like, and that's all he said it once, you know. Every time he asked, where do you want to be? A father. I mean, I don't know what you get it from. I don't know if he's looking at me as an example. <laughs> Boy. But that's what he is today. And he's a good father too. So you see, he did. But could he be a father when he was three, four years old? Come on. He got his dream. He got what he wanted to be. And God blessed him with the rest so he can do it. But I want to read a scripture there in the same Ecclesiastes 5. I want to drop down to the next verse, verse 4. And let's read that. Because I taught on this before. But I want to show you it right here. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it. For he has no pleasure. He was a fool. You know and you believe, but you don't want to do it. That's what a, that's what a fool is before. A person that knows and believes, but doesn't want to do it. He has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed. Better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. You made a mistake. You didn't mean it. Why should God be angry at you, your excuse, and destroy the work of your hands? No, God doesn't. Those people say, oh, you destroy work. No. So years can pass. You can start saying, oh, that's never going to happen. Uh-uh. God gives us time to change our minds. I tell you, that's mercy. So you see that? That was a little extra throw in there just to let us know. Don't give your word. And if you do, you promise God you're going to do something. Don't say, don't make an excuse and you don't do it. Listen, Paul, Paul was prophesied. Paul educated himself highly, best teacher in the land, Gamaliel, best college. He was on his way, thinking, doing God a favor. Remember he said, you got to be careful when you think you're doing God a favor? Huh? God had a call on his life. He thought he was fulfilling it. He thought he was fulfilling his own strength. He wanted to be a gospel preacher. So he went to the best schools. And God put his hand on him. God put his hand on him. I want us to turn to the book of Acts, chapter 26. Chapter 26. We're going to see. Everything we do takes time. Let God, you have to be, do you know to suffer for God, you have to be prepared? <coughs> I'll show you it. Look at verse 13. At midday, O king, along the road, he was going to Damascus to arrest everybody who believed in Jesus Christ. He was on his way to arrest. At midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun shining around me. 
and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in Hebrew language, exactly the language he spoke. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the prod. Remember that prod? There's a, you know, you ever saw the, the electrical prod that the police used? To, it, it, it was being used a long time, you know, to herd cattle. When, I, when I, let's say cows going on and I, I think to get slaughtered and they start to want to go, eat. they hit them one of those, what do you call it, those buzzers. They get a buzz and it goes, it was a big cow. When they use that buzz on humans, we humans can't take it, can stop our heart. But a cow just like, okay. He said, why are you kicking against the, pr I'm poking you. I'm poking you to go in that direction. Why are you backing up against it? Why are you bucking up against the direction, the direction I want to send you? I have a plan for you, Paul. But you don't, you're backing up against my plans. Sometimes, you see, we get in our own way. You're backing up against my plans. So I said, who are you, Lord? But did I finish? I have to stop there? No, go ahead. And he, uh, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet for I appear to you for this purpose to make you a minister, to make him. And a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I yet will reveal to you. I will, he was already educated, you know. He was the best educated man over the school. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive the forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God and do works befitting Repentance. He, he first had to be prepared to preach. Do you know how that took? When he got that light, he was, he was you know, you ever, uh, you ever got a, sh a shock or was a sh somebody tell you something and shocked you? When, when he heard that voice and say, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, the man went into shock. Then another man came, gave him a prophecy, tell him, boom, open his eyes, but he was blinded. Why, I'm going to send him to kings. He told him, and the eyes didn't want to go. And I said, I heard about this man. This man is persecuting us. There you go. I have a plan for him. I have a plan. Then he went back. You know, when, he, when his eyes was open, he went to Arabia. He went into the backside in the desert of Arabia to overcome what happened to him. Then he returned to Damascus and was preaching, but he only made trouble and wanted to kill him and let him down. That took three years. Going into Arabia, by the time he came back out, took time. Then he went to Jerusalem and he was making trouble. And Peter and them and the elders of the church tell him, they said, Paul, go, home to the, go back home to Tarsus. And he went home there. He was there for 12 years. See the time already? Look, look. Three years, 12 years. Then Barnabas came and looked for him. And he was an apprentice for one year with Barnabas. How many years is that? 16. Then he said, the Holy Ghost said, oh, separate me. Separate me now, this man. I will anoint him now to go out, preach the gospel. You think it was easy to fulfill that call yet? He went places, he was stoned, beaten with rods over and over to fulfill the call. He was beaten, stoned, shipwrecked in the ocean over and over in the deep to fulfill that call. Some people, oh, I want to be like Paul. You know, you ever heard people say, I want to be like Paul? You can. 
you have to walk the same road. If it is a good lawyer, you want to be one, guess what you're going to take a shortcut and be? You have to walk that same road. Let me tell you something. Let me go to someone else. While he was doing all this, that would happen. But finally, he was talking to Agrippa, but he wasn't talking Agrippa, he was a small king. He ended up in the courts of the most powerful nation at the time, Rome. Because when he called on Caesar, Caesar had to become his judge. So he was a Roman, he said, I call on Caesar as a Roman, only a head Roman can condemn him to death. He ended up and he witnessed the even to the greatest man with his power on earth. The call was fulfilled. And when that call was fulfilled, he was sent to be beheaded. And that was also part of his call. How he's going to suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he re received that sentence, I'm going to read to you about Peter and read to you about James. I'm going to tell you about Jesus Christ. We don't have time today. But then he was ready, he was sentenced to death. And as a Roman, they couldn't crucify him because he was a Christian, but he was also a Roman. And as a Roman, they couldn't crucify him like a normal Christian. So they decided to go and behead him. When they gave him the sentence, he was languishing in jail now to wait for the sentence to be carried out. And he wrote, he think he's writing the last letter to Timothy. So Timothy was like a, like a son to him. So Timothy, while he's writing, the Holy Ghost show him something. You need paper. You're going to need paper. He said, Timothy, come quick. I can remember you, and I can see your tears. Come quick. Bring me the cloakers cold in these dungeons. He had his house. When he was sentenced, he was taken out of the house and placed in a dungeon. For years, he lived in the house in Rome. That's where he wrote all of his letters. He told Timothy, come quick. Everybody abandon me. May God have mercy on them. The only people here with me is Luke and this one. And come quick, bring, but bring the parchment, bring the paper. Bring paper I can write on. But he had one more job to do. He had to write the book, Hebrews. The, book of, the greatest book in the Bible is the book of Hebrews. You want to know about Jesus? The whole Bible talks about him, but the book of Hebrews focuses. But when you're reading it, you're reading all about it. When you finish, it's like I read about somebody, but I can't put my hands on him. I can't lay, I can't lay my knowledge on this man. This man is above. I've read that book of Hebrews so many times. Right now I'm reading it. It has overwhelmed me. You read about a man, your life, why you can't understand him? Because his life and his ways are above our ways. When our ways align themselves to his ways, we will know him as he's known. Come on. And that's why God is training us. That's why the Lord is teaching us the gospel that we come to know him, because to get to know the Bible is not head knowledge. It's the changes we make in the life we now live. Now we get to know the man, that we may come to know him as he's known. That's the reason why. That is the number one purpose of coming to church, to hear the gospel that we can be fashioned and changed into the very image of Jesus Christ. So you see, it's not an easy task. So when the enemy come and try to waylay you with an idea or something, 
that's the purpose we come. The same reason why I'm teaching you it, but that's the same reason I was laid hold of. I was laid hold of for that same reason by the Lord Jesus Christ, that I may come to know him. And I'm telling you, it's not easy. So we're going to press in. We're going to learn. And we're going to continue to learn. And we don't have much time to learn. So we give the Lord how much time? And we give the Lord maybe today, and we come Wednesday maybe, and we look at those liberty hours, and we have to learn about this one man while we're trying to apply that knowledge to our lives, allowing him to change us, and we're going through the difficulty with change. We can cry out. <clears throat> cry out. Ask God. He is. <clears throat> <clears throat> There's nothing impossible. Whatever has to be broken can be broken. I had weaknesses that I could not conquer. I even challenged him. He delivered me. Once I went to my bedroom this week and I can't remember what it was. I never can. Even the memory of it was erased. I lay in my bed and I curled up like a child. And I was crying out, Lord, you got to deliver me. And I heard a bone snap. I thought by me I was pulling myself together so tight, I maybe broke. It wasn't a bone. When I stretched out, I couldn't even remember why I'd curled up. But that weakness never plagued me again. I heard when he broke the yoke. He allowed me to hear it. So you see, there's no, here I stand in front of you to tell you if he did it for me, he wants to do it for you. I'm your shepherd. I have to go before you. I have to take a step before you. And all I want is one step ahead of you. That when you follow close to me, you know exactly what you got. Do you want to get rid of a weakness? You can ask God to help you. And maybe it might be privileged also one day to hear when a yoke breaks. It's, I heard it. I heard a thought had broken a bone. It wasn't a bone. It was the yoke. I was delivered and set free by the power of God. And that power of God is available to all of us if we sincerely go to him in prayer. He will do it. There's nobody, there's nobody has any special privileges. There's nobody, nobody has a privilege. God does not have favoritism. What he can do for one, he wants to do for you, and he wants to do it better than the other one even. He wants to do greater things for us. He wants to do new things, things we haven't heard about. This is the God that we serve, and we're going to continue, because I'll tell you this, we are far more special than many, many sparrows. And one sparrow can't fall to the ground without him knowing the very hair your head that you lose has been numbered. He keeps track. This morning, this, to this morning, I'm getting ready. I'm washing the sink away, brushing my hair so, and I'm washing away the hair that's falling off my head. And you know something? And like, and like, I don't care. I just want to get rid. It doesn't look, doesn't look pleasant. But an angel was assigned by, by God to distract those numbers that he has recorded in heaven. That much he cares for us. I can't care one millionth for myself as he cares for me. I don't care about it here. I washed it down the drain like it is a nuisance. But he cares so much, he said, not even one hair of your head will fall to the ground or be washed into the sink without me knowing about it. I love you. That's what God is telling us. I love you. I have a plan. If you all give me a chance, and fulfill that plan in your lives. Have a plan. A plan to prosper you and not do you any harm, says the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's pray and give him thanks. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you with thanksgiving for your goodness and your tender mercies. For you declared that we are of more value to you than many sparrows that are sold for pennies. He said, not one of them shall fall to the ground. Then how much more are you, do you mean to me, says the Lord. We want to say thank you. We don't understand, can't grasp even that kind of love because we as humans don't understand that kind of love. But Lord God, by hearing it, we like grasping at it. We know one day we shall take hold of it because you will fulfill what you have started within us. So may you continue to have your way, Father, that we one day may look like him and appear like him when he appears. To continue having your way in our lives, and our hearts. We have come for you to do this work, Father. And this we do, Father, in Jesus' name. And let the church say, God bless you all.